let's start by Pratt. Thank you all for coming. It's nice to see this is the biggest group we've had since before the pandemic, so I've been, I'm excited about this. And uh, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, we'll just get started. So here's our first uh, chapter meeting for 2024. I want to thank Reversing Labs for providing the speaker and the food, refreshments. And I want to thank, um, I'm sorry, Ben? Ben. Ben. Uh, and okay. for offering up, yeah, offering up uh, this this wonderful space. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, a round of applause for that. Both of you. All of you. <laughs> and uh, let's see. I want to start off by talking about a few things uh, OWASP needs. So at least the local chapter needs. We need, first of all, we're getting a booth at Secure 360 again this year. Really excited about that. Those of you who have been to that before, uh, we used to be there, and then last year we had a little snafu with organization and didn't go. So um, this year we're going again. It's all set up. Even have swag to pass out. <laughs> um, so that's uh, May 15th and 16th. If you're already going, great. Stop by the booth. If you're possibly able to help sit at the booth on those days, one or both, both would be perfect. Uh, email Zoa or myself and uh, let us know um, if, uh, uh, you know, if you can. If we could use one more person and yep. we could get one more person in free. Yep, yep. Good point. Yeah, so you get, get in free. Um, you, know, you can go to all the talks. They feed us. It's great. Uh, at the end of the first day, there's a happy hour. I won't talk about the quality of the drinks, but uh, <laughs> um, stick to the bottles. I would say, yeah. Yeah, they put the wine in cans. The, the, yeah, the canned wine was weird. Um, anyway, so aside from that, if you can, great. If you're going to be there, stop by, uh, pick up some yo yo's and stuff. I'm not joking. Um, also, in general, OWASP MSD needs speakers. If you have any sort of expertise in any field, somewhat related to security, let us know. Um, and you want to talk. You know, there's, there's always that secondary thing, right? Um, it can be something really informal. Uh, we, we've set up, we had a really good turnout for a lunch and learn that Zoe and I ran. Uh, what was that last November, I think? And uh, it was easy to put together, and it was virtual. Um, but if you want to give a talk in, a, you know, in person as well, it's great to do that here. Uh, come up with a talk and, and give it in person. Um, there's also leadership opportunities if you want to help organize. We always need help with that. Uh, there's, there's three of us, and, and uh, Karen hasn't been able to help out very much. Uh, we can barely keep our heads above water running this thing ourselves. Um, so we're, we're going to try and hold these once a quarter. If we had more help, we could definitely run them more often. Um, let's see. So leadership opportunities, volunteer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, OWASP in general uh, has a lot of really great projects that always need help. Uh, we don't run them, but the OWASP global OWASP thing needs them. Um, and uh, yeah, you can do searches on OWASP's website for all these projects that, that are always looking for help. Um, how to contact us? If you go to this page up here, um, oh, just, just Google OWASP MSP and all this stuff comes up. You don't have to write this down. Um, go up here, our emails are on the side, so you'll be able to reach us there. Um, you all have seen the meetup page by now. That's where all of our meter, uh, meetups are going to be. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, which is where I post. We post uh, the videos. Um, welcome. And uh, we have a mailing list that we don't use very often, uh, but it's there. Let's see. There's pizza. And uh, just for showing up, you can get CP. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet right there. Um, if you don't want to put in your name and email address, that does not go outside of OWASP. In fact, I don't even send it to OWASP. It's more for our benefit if anybody needs 
evidence that they were here and they can get you know, CBEs for being here. And we won't spam them. No, no, we don't spam. We only email about, about chapter stuff and meetups. Um, let's see. Yeah, and and, uh, and again, if you give a talk, you get even more geek, which is awesome. I also like to put uh, leave a little space in here if there are any employment opportunities that people know about and work for companies that have openings that people might be interested in, or you're looking for a job. So, anybody? We're almost always hiring developers. Okay, almost always hiring developers. In what? Um, software. She asked earlier what I did, what I was, and I thought I was doing this, but I'm playing on a very literal response. It's just being difficult. Uh, yeah, uh, mostly .NET stuff, <laughs> Angular, Web, API, Microsoft Stack, LAN, SQL Server. Okay. I can web dev, I need a job. <laughs> Kurt, that guy. Hello. <laughs> Talk to him about Kurt. Yeah. Sounds good. Excellent. We're not hiring right now, but we're yeah. almost always hiring. Yeah. So not like this minute. No, we have a good job. Like that's our problem. Like, Under your chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So anything else? Uh, yeah, yeah. I got a staff application security engineer position open up on my team. So if anybody can just come talk to me about that. What does that involve? In who you work for? Uh, Airbnb. So we're mostly oh, cool. working in Java and Ruby. It discounts. <laughs> so, so that does the application security person do development? Uh, no, it's mostly an advisory role. Okay, and is it remote or in person? Remote. Cool. And that's on like Airbnb's employment yeah. site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? Field CISO at Reversing Labs, which uh, has an awesome logo, I might add. I, I just I saw that and I thought, that's really cool. Um, speaking on the monsters in your software supply chain that traditional AppSec tools can't find. Um, want me to read your bio? I'll do it. OK. It's probably okay. easier. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll introduce yourself. Yeah, I can do that. All right. Um, I know I am. There we go. And plug you back in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone <laughs> for coming tonight. I'm happy to see such a good turnout. I know the pandemic squashed a lot of OWASP chapters and they struggled to get back up and going. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that the Minneapolis area OWASP chapter is, you know, has a pretty good turnout because I've actually been to a couple of, and there's been like two or three people and they were just looking for jobs. Um, <laughs> my background, my, dad, my name is Matt Rose and I always point to my arm. That's why I have the Rose tattoo. So if I forget my name, I can just look at my arm. It's, uh, anybody, I'm all about obscure references. Anybody remember the movie Memento? Anybody? He tattooed so he could remember every time he woke up. Um, I am the field CISO for Reversing Labs. Um, does anybody know what a field CISO is or why you get that title? I've just been doing this a really, really long time. And that's what they call somebody with this beard. Uh, uh, at this point in my career, um, I've been in AppSec about 20 years when AppSec wasn't really even a thing. Um, if anybody's uh, been in the industry a while, I was one of the first employees at Fortify when it was still an uh, incubated uh, startup by Kleiner Perkins. It was in Kleiner Perkins' basement. Um, nobody knew what. SAS was at that point. SAS wasn't even an acronym. Static Application Security Testing, which is going to be part of my presentation. Um, and I, I like to kind of share a lot of the stories I've had. And, uh, at that point in my career, I was a sales engineer, and I pretty much I have no hair because I've worn so many hats over the years uh, in so many different roles. But the analogy and the story I had was working with a major technology company, which you probably have had access to, and this was back in the day of. IPS, IDS, firewalls, network security, and we came into this large technology company to talk about the security of their software and their applications. Um, and they sit down and said, well, why do we need you? We have an IPS, IDS, firewall. We're all locked down on the network. 
no, it's your code that's a problem. They're like, what do, you, what do you mean my code? Why is that a problem? And they're like, well, there are certain types of vulnerabilities in your code, and this is when OWASP was still very, very young, probably just starting out, didn't have chapters anywhere, it was just a concept at that point. And they said, well, they scan the code for vulnerabilities and find, and they, you ever see a dog watch television? And it kind of goes blank and cocks its head to the side, and cocks its head, <clears throat> looking at me like it was some sort of alien. They said, there are vulnerabilities, what about SQL injection, cross-site scripting? And they said, that sounds really perverse, you're gonna be what to my code? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's kind of like the, the type of stories I have, the type of experiences I've done. I've worked all over the world. I ran Asia Pacific for a couple of years, but in this, that's how you get kind of the field CISO role, um, is just experience, and I do a ton of press. I ran a podcast for a while. If you go to reversinglabs.com resources, um, I got creative during the pandemic because I used to do these type of events, and I would also do solution architecture sessions with customers to draw out secure SDLCs or DevSecOps programs, talk about the best places to inflect all the star ASD, um, and yes, I did. I do have a trademark on that, so nobody can use star ASD. That's fine. I came up with it. I'll let you use it. Just be nice to me. Um, came up with a new concept of using a teaching glass board to record videos, and I use that, and I get actually stopped. Well, I'm a little weird looking, but I get stopped at conference and go, you're the glass board guy. And I always do say I appreciate that we're getting recorded here, because I always like to say I have a face for radio, but I do a lot of video as well, so I apologize for that. So let's jump in. Um, just as I know we have a bunch of people here, the title, I, this is a newer version of the Monsters. I kind of updated it, changed it, so a little different concept, a little different feel. I do a lot of pop culture references, a lot of weird analogies, and uh, I was doing the Monsters for a while, and Dan, uh, my colleague, asked me to do this, but I updated it, so this is the first time this one's ever been given. Same concepts. Some same images, but a little bit updated. But I'm assuming you guys saw the title, and either you just like, oh crap, I need some free pizza, or the title <laughs> was interesting to you. Anybody want to share with me? Was it the title or the pizza? Probably the title, honestly. The title? <laughs> oh, there are monsters in this one, too. It's just a little bit of a, a different flair, and you know, if anybody wants to stick around, I can show you where it's different. Um, so the concept, anything else? The fact that it was an OWASP meetup. Taking place, yeah, in person. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like it's so 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Anyone else? We use a competitor's product, so I was curious to see how it compares. If we get to that, that's right. Excellent. Well, you might have a different view. It might not be a competitor after you see this presentation. Uh, Collaborating? Mm, not really. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't even touch on that one, but we can talk afterwards. <laughs> so let's jump in. The biggest thing, make sure it's here we go. There is a storm coming. Software supply chain security. Anybody hear about it before? Yeah. You know, I use Ron Burgundy. You know, I'm kind of a big thing. Software supply chain is kind of a big thing these days. But what does it mean? I bet if I went through the room and asked everybody in the room, what's your definition of software supply chain security? Something different is going to come. It's an umbrella concept. People think it's one thing, but the analogy is it's just like application security. If you're doing app, if you have an application security program, that's an umbrella for a lot of different processes, people, technologies. Software supply chain is the same thing. You have different concepts associated with software supply chain security that you think you're secure from. You think this, you know, I thought this was a really cool picture to represent a storm. I've never seen anything, and this is probably AI generated anyway, it's probably not even real, but Still thought it was cool. Just doing the same old, same old that you've been doing with your application security testing tools, the star AST tools, is not going to work for software supply chain security. And I'm going to give a ton of evidence and information to back that statement up. But when you're thinking about defining software supply chain security, there's a ton of different things. You talk about, guess what, software composition analysis, SCA. For some reason, the industry analysts, the Gartners, the Foresters, blessed software composition analysis as the end-all be-all <coughs> to software supply chain security. Scan the open source, because depending on what you read, 40 to 80 to 90% of all modern software and applications are made up of open source. That, that's great. But what about the other 20%? It just takes one vulnerable aspect, and that could be first-party code, second-party code, third-party code, dependencies, 
caught software in your package that you're carrying and feeding for that is compromised. So yes, software, and I don't, and I've been in this industry a long time, I don't diminish any of the technologies of underneath that application security or star AST. They're all great at looking for one thing, not one thing, but risk, vulnerabilities, and I'll get into the difference between vulnerabilities and malware in a second. Um, but just looking at the vulnerabilities within open source is not a secure software supply chain story. Just like securing the DevOps pipeline, you know, there is that lens that it's a direct correlation between, let's say, the manufacturing industry where you have an assembly line, a supply chain, and software bill of materials, a, a bill of materials for the car or the x-ray machine. But just securing that doesn't mean you don't know if something was compromised. And then you jump in again with that same kind of thinking about embedded software. Well, you're building something, you're putting software, medical devices is a key area there, where you're thinking about the firmware and securing the firmware. So does everybody get where I'm going? It's like there's a lot of different aspects and lenses associated with software supply chain security. But the best way to think about this storm that's brewing is the identification of malware, known malware, but also the identification of potential malware, which is the harder thing to do. So again, I'm going to jump in and uh, please don't laugh at some of my slides. <laughs> I'm, again, I'm getting a little bit older and uh, I didn't have Netflix and YouTube and everything like that. When you were sick as a kid, there were two things that were paramount to your day. Bob Barker and the Price is Life and Days of Our Lives. Does anybody have the tagline or can remember the tagline for Days of Our Lives? Like sands through the hourglass. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Thank you. I'll give you the five bucks I owe you later. <laughs> so, why, why do I have sands through the hourglass days of our lives? Because again, having a different visual representation, just a lot of like icons that you throw together to represent something gets boring. I like to be a little more creative. So let's take the days of our lives and talk about a, a, a development process in software supply chain. Let's flip the days of our lives, um, hourglass on its side, and think about the two sides of the equation. On the left, we have the developer writing code in their IDE. This is the code they're writing, checking code in, checking code out from, hey, their code repo, Git, GitHub, whatever you're using for the source code repository of your application. Then you also have the binary repositories. So use JFrog, because if you know binary repositories, you probably know JFrog artifact. Then you're jumping in and you're talking about the actual platform that builds your software, the CI orchestration layer. And you use Circle CI, we'll talk about them in a little bit as well because they kind of got a little bit of a bugaboo associated with software supply chain. Then you also have the build system. This is MS Build. Um, there's many different build systems, but the, circle, the uh, CI orchestration sits above the build system. I like to call it the conductor of the orchestra. It points at all the different pieces to make beautiful music or beautiful software and application. We hope. And then the last one, which is kind of where everybody's head immediately goes to when you talk about software supply chain security, is the open source resources, the uh, NPM or PyPy, and you know all the different types of attacks that are trying to trick people with typo squatting. <coughs> people familiar with typo squatting? Yeah. Sounds like the stupidest thing in the world. I did an experiment, and it actually works. Like you, <laughs> naming things one letter off, and like having Matt with two T's, Matt with three T's. It's and, and people will grab it, just like, oh, that must be it. It sounds stupid, but a lot of these attacks start off very, very rudimentary and explode from there. So this is the left side. The right side, you're going to take and you're going to create something, and that's this choke point right here. You're doing all this work. You have all your development staff, you have your infrastructure, your architecture, threat modeling, all this type of stuff, but you build an entity. And that entity is what you use for your own customers or sell to somebody for that matter. And then you're gonna to deploy it to a cloud environment, into a container, into a data center. Everybody's secure now, right? <laughs> There's an inflection point here. It's right here in the middle where you have a snapshot in time, post-compilation, pre-deployment, to have a final exam, to verify all that hard work you did, even if you have the most robust bleeding edge technologies and the smartest people, the error is human, and you know what? There's no such thing as completely secure software or processes. 
It's the thing you're not looking for that you won't find. So in this middle, this is where you create that artifact, that DLL, that WAR file, that ISO, uh, the JAR file, whatever you're building. You need a final exam of this to make sure you're passing what I like to call the sniff test. What's the sniff test? Do you ever do this with a friend? Smell this milk. Do you think it smells bad? <laughs> That's what it is. You have to vet this because looking for no malware, we're going to get into the details of attacks in a second. They can happen at many different places. Just doing one thing is not effective in terms of software supply chain risk. But I have all these AST tools. I have check marks. I have Veracode. I have whatever it is. Uh, Synopsis is entire suite. I have SNCC. I'm totally covered from software supply chain risk. Maybe not. So it's about pieces and the whole. And if anybody can, I'm going to jump in and ask if anybody knows who these guys are. The first one is API scan. This is, you know, we're talking, it's a new, one of the newer application security testing technologies. You have SALT, you have no name, you have traceable <coughs> that are looking at the security of the APIs. Because APIs, really an application is an ecosystem. It's not just an entity. It uses other entities to function either from a data standpoint or a functionality standpoint. Um, does anybody know who these guys are? I see you have, who is it? Oh, no, I don't know what that is. You don't know what that is? No, I can't no, see it. Is it a transformer? It's a transformer, it's a specific transformer. Okay, I owe him 10 bucks, because that's the hard one. I've never even heard of that transformer. Don't ask me any good questions, that's all I got for this. So, <laughs> if you're just looking for risk in the APIs, you're only gonna find risk in the APIs. And these are the type of things that you're finding, you know, from an API standpoint, excessive data exposure, insufficient logging, monitoring, rogue APIs, authentication issues. You're talking source code, you're talking SaaS, or static application security testing. When you're looking for, hey, guess what, we're at a OWASP meeting, OWASP top 10 type things. SQL injection, cross-site scripting, validation, <coughs> all the things associated with the source code itself. Then you move into the open source packages, software composition analysis. These are the type of risks that you're looking for is open source package risks, licensing issues. Is this open source package allowed to be in a commercial product or do you owe royalties back to the project itself if you put it in a for sale or for purchase type application? And then an upgrade path. Hey, you're in version 1.1, that's bad. You need to go to version 1.2. They fixed a bunch of stuff, or even auto remediation. You have a running application, a front, an application in a running state, and this is where you have dynamic application security testing, or even manual pen testing, testing from the outside in. So instead of trying to find SQL injection in the code, now you're trying to actually make SQL injection or cross site scripting happen. And everybody knows, you know, I always say DAS is still a thing, but it's been around a long time. How many people can name a antiquated, not antiquated, but let's say a little older DAS tool? Anybody? No one? Web Inspect. Web Inspect, there's a good one. <laughs> anybody? That's smart. There's another good one. Well, they, they got acquired and they're now part of yeah. whatever. I'm just going way back. I mean, Herb. Herb Suite, yeah. Herb well, Watchfire, I mean, there's a ton, but <coughs> think about how long ago those were, but people are still doing it, especially from a manual pen testing standpoint. So you're looking for the lens of risk in running, but it's pretty much you're looking kind of for the same things as you are with SAS, as you are with DAST and manual pen testing, but just at a different state. So if you just test the code, maybe it exists in code, but you're not gonna see it until you execute it, or maybe it only happens dynamically at runtime. There's different lenses of risk that you have to be cognizant Next one to think of is QA. This is where, again, a newer technology of IS. Who knows the definition of IS? Anybody? Wasn't it interactive? Interactive application security testing. This is different than DAST because it's inside out from the application. It's either baked into the application or it's an agent within the app server itself that verifies the flow. If it sees something and it happens and it triggers something, it'll report it back to you and it's all leveraged by a functional test created by QA. So it's a way to leverage something that already exists, that functional test, and the functional test is, you're not in the QA world, it's like I log in, I view some records, I delete some records, I log out. That was a functional test that functionally did. And what it can do is leverage that to point out risk, the same type of risk as, say, SAS and DAS, but from a different lens. I mean, it's defense in depth is what we're looking at. The Selenium test, right? Yeah, we're focused, any type of functional test. 
Um, and then in production, I won't get into this because this never really took off. I think it's a cool concept, which is runtime application self-protection, which is basically a web application firewall or WAF in the code itself, and it can block or view traffic. Um, there's kind of a conflict of interest because it's a security product baked into a running application that may be mission critical. And if there's ever an issue, the person responsible for the uptime is like, just get that rash crap out of there. So it's, it's always been a little bit of a hard sell. I've seen it work in some places, but not too often. So if you're looking at six different areas, you're going to find six different lenses of risk in a component, but not a whole. Okay. What's your name? Yeah. Rick. Okay. The constructor cons become who? <laughs> <laughs> you got one answer out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're my expert on all things Transformers. Um, you volunteer. I can't believe I remember that. So <laughs> the constructor cons come together. It's kind of like Deadpool. You know, like a Voltron, <laughs> five lines. Six robots become Devastator. <laughs> this is your compiled package. This is your source code. This is your open source. These are your APIs. This is, just like the days of our lives flipped on its side, the ISO, the WAR file, the DLL. This is the piece of software, the application. And it has a completely different lens of risk than all these pieces of the puzzle. And I use this to represent pieces rather than the whole. I could have used a puzzle, but that would have been boring. Um, so again, I like to be a little obscure with the way I do things. So when you think of software supply chain security, you think of binary analysis ripping apart the compiled package to know if there is existing malware in there. Because you may think you've found everything, but it may have slipped in, and I'll give some examples in a second. A diff of multiple releases. The sniff test, version 1.1, and then compare it and diff it against 1.2 have an architectural spec. I'm expecting these things to happen in this release. So if you see something way off the reservation or very strange, hey, now you have indicators of a potential software supply chain breach. Because the thing is, a lot of these novel attacks are novel. They're new. They've never been seen before. But they have the same DNA. It's kind of like forensic files. And I prefer the older forensic files versus the new one. And just seeing them getting on a, a DOS prompt to you know, process DNA, just kind of <laughs> laugh, but uh, I digress. Um, they have the same fingerprints in the DNA. They're doing kind of the same things, but in a new and slightly tweaked way. So that's how you have to think about differential analysis. One of the other things is SBOM is a huge deal. The federal government in the executive order, 14028, I believe it is, and don't hold me to that. SBOMs are important, but it's, a lot of people just latched on to SBOM. Again, past history story. Everybody jumped on, we're Agile DevOps. Anybody heard that? Yeah. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I want to say to people, they're like, oh yeah, we're Agile DevOps. And I'm like, are you talking about the, the noun or the verb? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, are you talking about the software development methodology of Agile? Or some of its siblings, Kanban, whatever that is. Or you say, hey, we're really flexible to change. I can do a backbend. I can do a jumping jacks. <laughs> so I always want to know, it's like when somebody says, we're Agile DevOps. I'm like, are you flexible or using a methodology? Because people just latch on to a term and use it. That's what we're getting with SBOM. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I do an SBOM. Here, look at the product. This is the SBOM. Here's a list. I'm like, the list of what? And this is where you know the software composition analysis vendors, they provide you an SBOM of the open source. I'm like, what about all the other stuff? And the thing is, these SBOMs have to be an industry standard. What is the OAuth standard the SBOM format? Come on, guys, you're in an OWASP. Right? <laughs> it was a homework DX. assignment. I don't know everything about OWASP. Come on. <laughs> Cyclone DX. Cyclone DX is an OWASP standard for an SBOM. And then the Linux Foundation has um, also one, which is SPDX. So those are kind of the two. There's a bunch of other ones that are kind of a little bit offshoots based on industry or specific niches. But if you're looking at SBOM format, look for Cyclone DX, which is OWASP format, or SPDX, which is Linux Foundation. And then you, you know, looking at tampering. Tampering is kind of the, again, sub-level overarching. Looking for compromised secrets, looking for potential uh, differential analysis, red flags. This is all tampering. And I'm going to talk about there is a prime example of tampering with a recent software supply chain attack. Um, and then secrets misconfiguration. Secrets are a huge problem. But again, last thing people want is more noise. Anybody ever hear of the acronym YAST? 
yes. Yet another security tool? Yet another security tool. <laughs> I don't need a yes. And a lot of times you're like, secrets, secrets, secrets. Yes, very, very, very important. You know, secrets are the lock and the key to allow you to access the functionality or the, <clears throat> or the information. Maybe it's sensitive PII information, credit card information, uh, which would map to PCI. But not all secrets are important. There's test secrets. There's secrets that don't ask anything, access anything important or any type of important functionality. So not only identifying secrets, but identifying which ones you should actually be caring about. I'm gonna move in. What's, any questions up to this point? Anybody can throw anything at me or totally disagree. Um, that the only, I always say the only bad question is the one that's not asked. And these type of events I really like people to learn from their peers rather than just me. So do you feel your software supply chain is safe? You keep using that word. I don't think you know what it means. Yes, my software supply chain is safe. How? How, how are you ensuring this? Anybody know who this is? Nigo Montoya. And Nigo Montoya. And which is his catchphrase? My name is Nigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepared to die. There you go. Well, <laughs> my name is Matt Rose. You messed up my supply chain. You're going to be screwed. <laughs> so we have to think about not just saying the word of software supply chain security, but actually doing it. A lot of times, again, with Agile DevOps, people would say it because they felt comfortable and it made them one of the cool kids. We're really interested in software supply chain security, but doing the right things is a lot different than just saying the words. Software supply chain security is all about what malware got into your software and applications, your, you need to know when your software is malware. If malware is in your software, then your software is malware. I hate to break it to you. So we have our nice, you know, mild-mannered uh, gamma radiation physicist uh, and Bruce Banner and has a slight accident and now he's the Hulk. You don't want your software to become the Hulk. You don't want it to go smash buildings or damage your customers. Does anybody know how many customers the sunburst attack that focused on solar winds affected. A lot is a lot, but we haven't anybody have a ballpark number? It's eighteen thousand. And think about it this way. This is more like Ocean's Eleven the Long Con is software supply chain security. The nefarious dudes, hackers as they like to call them, have gotten smarter. They could go try and hack Dan or hack me, get maybe my address, social security number, but I gotta do that to everybody in the room. No, I gotta do that to everybody in Minnesota to actually get something of interest. And I have to go through an interesting cycle, and maybe I can get somebody with, you know, sending Dan a, a fake text message or a shipping app or hacking his phone or things like that. Or I could study and prod a major software vendor, find a way to slip something in that's beneficial to me, and then just let normal distribution process Push it out. How many times a day on your phone, on your computer? You need a software update. Sure, it's Google, it's Microsoft, it's Apple. Yeah, upgrade. That could be a software. That new upgrade could be a compromised package, which is exactly what happened with SolarWinds, and which is what the hackers and nefarious dudes are depending on. You're, they're compromising a, a trusted source, somebody that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and using that trust to trick people. And most of these companies don't really know this is even happening. So let's talk about the actual attacks. Again, probably again AI generated, but I thought it was a cool, it's probably from like, you know, Independence Day or something, but I liked it as a visual and I thought it went well with the background. So let's talk about the major software supply chain attacks over the last few years. Anybody hear about 3CX? Anybody? Hands, hands. 3CX is a video voice over IP company, phone system company. It was compromised in a way that was very interesting <coughs> and it was very unique. They had uh, kind of the, the standard company out there that for um, viruses, which is Virus Total, they would scan and they got some interesting information back. Their customers scanned their package with Virus Total and there were some things in there that didn't look right. Again, it didn't pass the sniff test. They went and scanned it themselves and said, that's a false alarm. No, nothing's happening here. Well, it was a compromise of the signed package itself. 
They figured the package is signed, it's got to be good. Well, they compromised and put malware on top of the signed package and then let it be distributed out. And if you're not familiar with uh, signing of packages, I'll use the Game of Thrones reference. People, anyone? Game of Thrones fans? Anyone? Maybe a little? Mm -hmm. It's like the Raven. You know, with signed packages, you get a letter, oh, there's a Raven, and they break open the, the wax seal, you know, it has been compromised. A signed package, a signed piece of software, the seal hasn't been broken. So you know it's safe. Well, this was a signed package, and the vulnerability was actually in the signing process, not in the source code, not in the APIs, not in the runtime. It was in the signing process of the, the upgrade to software itself, and it affected thousands of people because everyone just upgraded their software. Next one, as I mentioned, was Sunburst, um, which affected SolarWinds, affected 18,000 customers, give or take, based on which article you read or which uh, report you go over. This was even more interesting. They got into the systems and watched and basically found a way to insert the malware directly into the MS build environment. So as you're building the software, they just basically slip malware in, it was compiled as part of the package, and guess what? 18,000 individuals, government entities, were all compromised by the Sunburst attack. Again, different. This was compromise of the signing process. This was compromise of the build, where they just pointed the build at all the good components and some lots of good ones. Code cop. This is the one I like to give the analogy of. Anybody see? I get, I get a little obscure with my, my analogies. The Americans. Anybody see the Americans? Just the first season. I, I liked. I thought it was great, but they were. It was in the '80s, and it was Cold War spies, USA versus Russia type stuff, and they were always trying to like compromise the secretary or the phone system. Very, very simplistic, old world type of hacking. Guess what? That's what CodeCob was. They hijacked the credentials of a developer of CodeCob, which allowed them to gain access to the code repositories. Software supply chain attack but much different than 3CX Sunburst. This is now compromising an individual's credentials, or if you really squint your eyes, a secret. Talking about secrets, it's not just the software itself, it's the software that it actually, it's the platforms that actually build it, where CircleCI, one of, the, one of the most, maybe not the most, but very, very well known CI orchestration platform was compromised. Never really knew what happened here. But it's very, very strange that they inform anyone using Circle CI to rotate their secrets on everything. Guess what? Rotating your secrets is good hygiene. The connection to your database, the connection to functionality. Guess how many people, you know, look at your own organization. Don't raise your hand and answer this, but you say we rotate our secrets, but how often do you actually rotate your secrets? You should do it, but a lot of times, and I, I heard stories where people were like, yeah, we had a plan in place, we hadn't rotated our secrets in three years. And, and the process with that, the reason is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> it's like, you know, dead code. You find dead code from a, a, like, don't take it out, because we don't know really what that does, it's dead, but if we take it out, everything, the build fails, but it's not being called by anything, but we have no way. Same thing with secrets. Hey, everything's connecting and working, let's not mess with anything. So I'm going to pause here. Any questions at this point? I know we talk a lot. Yeah. I do have a question. I'm not fully in the InfoSec lane. I'm kind of more cloud. Mm -hmm. My question on all of this is, has any of you wonderful developers, coders, engineers found any backdoors from the government sectors in anything <laughs> that you guys do? Because oh. that's always a curiosity of mine. Is well, that's you guys why are looking for risk. Well, that's why the, the uh, executive office uh, released a memorandum about building the, um, what's the, what's the word they put into it? The rigidity, I think is what they called it, it's a very government term, of software supply chain and providing an SBOM. The memorandum said, hey, you have to provide this if you want to sell to the government moving forward, because they were one of the ones that got bit by Sunburst. And that's what really caused this thing. Um, and But again, they still have to operate, so they're like, we want you to self-attest or provide us an S-bomb of what's in the application or software package you're selling to us. You don't have to give us an S-bomb, but we really, really, really like an S-bomb. If you read the follow-on memorandum, and then you actually create, there's a couple agencies that came out of this, and this was all really spawned by Sunburst. 
So the government is aware of this because nation state attacks, I mean, and, and it would basically call back, sunburst attack would basically map back the Lazarus group, which is out of North Korea. Because you hear about all these back doors built into like all the electronics that we have that the government can get into our stuff or these huge monopolies like Microsoft can just sniff and do whatever they want like they're malware it's, it's in themselves. It's, it's true, and I mean, we could go down a whole conspiracy theory path, but <laughs> it, it, it's really a lot of times it's not the organization, it's somebody compromising the organization itself. So okay. I don't look at it like this, like Microsoft is putting back doors into their code to spy on us. It's more about nation state attacks from Russia or China or North Korea putting something in Microsoft, and you trust Microsoft. Gotcha. And then, so it's not thinking about supply chain like the company's doing it, it's the nefarious dudes, as I like to call them, doing it, and then, you know, it's like, somebody's poisoning your McDonald's coffee. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. So, thinking about all these type of things, anybody want to take a stab at this? What's the difference between a vulnerability and malware? When we talk about these things, the AST tools, AST tools are really all about finding vulnerabilities. But then people talk vulnerabilities and malware. What, what's the difference? Vulnerability, malware that hasn't happened yet? <coughs> kind of. How about uh, malware is, is, has intent behind it, and 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 it's probably hidden better yes. than a vulnerability would be. Think about it in this way: a vulnerability is something outside the bounds of the intended purpose. I function I, the, the application functionally does what it's supposed to. You know that example: I log I log in, I view some records, I delete some records, I log out. Functionally does the right thing, but it also does anything. Like with SQL injection. You put in user ID one two three four, and you get and your user ID one two three four, and you get all that data back. But then you put into the field user ID one two three four single quote equals single quote one, nullifying the where criteria of that SQL call. Now you're getting all the data back. It's going outside the bounds of the intended purpose. So it's kind of like a oops. It did what it was supposed to, but it does some other stuff I wasn't even thinking about. And that's what OWASP top ten is all about. And then you know OWASP top ten for APIs and all this type of stuff about vulnerabilities, about finding things that it's not supposed to do or giving away information. Malware is just built to be bad. That's why it's malicious software. There's goodware and there's malware. <laughs> it's malicious software. It never had a good intent. It, it never really had a good intent. It's just trying to get in there and just be a bully. So, and a lot of the things that I had on the transformer slide, all those things were looking for vulnerabilities, <coughs> not per se, malware. And if you look, if you had all those AST tools, the best of breed, and I can rattle off all of them, SAS, DAS, IAPS, RAS, SCA, all of them, manual pen tests, they would not have found 3CX, they would not have found Sunburst, they would not have found CodeCob, and they would not have found the vulnerabilities of certain CI, because they're looking for vulnerabilities, not known malware, or the path to malware. So, <coughs> I know, I know, there's homework. <laughs> you can choose to do it. I will not hold the nerds against you. Again, using Game of Thrones. Um, go to the blue chip, Gardner Magic Quadrant, Forrester Wave leaders that talk about application security and software supply chain security. Go to the check marks of the world, the Veracodes of the world. These are great companies and they do a great job at finding what they're designed to find. Their story around software supply chain security is just pointing at open source. There is going to be no mention of malware. And really what a software supply chain attack is, how <coughs> malware got in there, and if it's been found. So the homework assignment is just don't, don't spend a ton of time, but you'll find it very interesting. All these people talk about <coughs> software supply chain security, just like they talk about Agile DevOps or S-bombs. They want to be part of the cool kids club, but really software supply chain security comes down to malware, if you're not looking for malware, I don't know how either the application that you're developing or consuming, because guess what? This, uh, we didn't, this is just one presentation talking about AST tools, which really look at your code. There's a total different conversation about third-party risk management about the software you consume to run your business. As simplistic as upgrading the version of the FedEx shipping app. I mean, if I was a nation state attacker, I'd talk, I would look at like a major technology information platform I look at something mundane that is going to be upgraded without any thought, a shipping app, oh, some sort of charting app or application that uh, creates 
don't know, widgets. I mean, how often do you think someone's like, oh, you need a new version of the FedEx shipping app or the UPS shipping app? Oh, sure, update it. Well, if that was attacked, it could be much worse than SolarWinds ever was. And that's all I had today. Hopefully that wasn't too boring or painful. I appreciate the interaction. Um, I'm going to be around for a while. Anyone have any questions? Or any, you want to ask me 101? Or does anyone want to just throw it out there? So what do you suggest we do about it? I mean, it's like if our tools don't work, they work for the lens. No, no, I mean, if there's this that's what big reverse, that's gaping what, hole in the middle. That's where the final exam needs to come, and you can talk to Dan. That's what we do is okay. we reverse engineer that to really find that because nobody's doing that final exam, that final sniff test, because you could scan the source code and developer ID. You could scan your code repositories. you got to break it apart. You know, it, it, you know car companies crash the car. I want to see what's going to work and what's don't. I mean, you always see the car sliding on the track and hitting the wall and bursting, and you're like, okay, the driver would have survived. You can't do that until you break the car. <laughs> That's kind of with the same with your software. You're not going to find things in there unless you break it back apart, because think about SolarWinds. That was at the MS Build file. That's what put it together, and they said, well, I already did my testing you know, at the developer desktop, at the code repos, at all these pieces. You have to actually think about that. And even taking that same concept of reverse binary analysis for software you're not even developing. Because it's, it's easy to get, you gotta get a binary from somebody. It's gonna be that war file, that DLL, the ISO, whatever it is. Vet that before you come in. Or even if your company's acquiring something, you can use that same concept to vet what you're buying as well. Because again, anybody in security do security questionnaires. You're starting an <laughs> app -like program, you do security questionnaires. That's that's part of it. <laughs> Think about this. How many, if you ever, security questionnaires, if you're not familiar with the concept, is, hey, I'm going to buy you, and the, the T's and C's of uh, the contract to buy the software is like, it, do you do security testing? What type of testing? What's your remediation process? When you do find a bug, is anybody going to say, my baby's ugly, my software sucks, we do testing on it, but we never fix anything? Nobody's going to say that. No. We're at a point in this world where we have to actually call BS and do the analysis yourself because if you're not doing it, again, nobody's going to give you back a questionnaire that says, yeah, we ran a dynamic test against this two years ago. I think it was good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where the port is. Those are oh, features. we released 100 times a day. <laughs> but you know, a lot of times, because we just went through and did that whole risk analysis, a lot of times people will say, yeah, we do it, and then when you ask them, it's not that they're lying to you, it's that they don't know. Yeah, and they're just like, <clears throat> yes, 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 yes. I mean, how many people fill yeah. out paperwork right now where you're like, you know, have you ever been abducted by aliens? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Do you breathe oxygen? No. I'm like, we just, we're so in much of the, the yes, no mode, you just <laughs> slip, slip over it. So what's an example then of how reversing lab would, would fit into that? The um, hourglass, like where do you guys come in? At that inflection point. And Post compilation. Like pre how does your process work then? You it picks up the, as soon as it can actually be hooked up. So it basically picks up the binary, analyzes it, and the, the platform is built. We can scan up to 10 gig files, huge files. So and and basically automated. break it back. Yeah, automated. <coughs> so after the last step, of, let's say Circle CI runs it, pulls all the pieces together, builds it, successful build. I have that artifact. Let's say it's a it's a DLL for a Microsoft app. It would then immediately be sent to um, Reversing Labs to break it back apart and map the policy, see if there's known malware, because we immediately check against the known malware, or give you that tampering type lens of, hey, this is supposed to be a one file change. I'm seeing 50 files change. I'm seeing these new behaviors. Do you know that the communication is all of a sudden over port 80? Is it supposed to be over port 80? <laughs> what happened to 443? What happened to encryption? We just gave up on that? So that's, it's, it's automated just like you think about SAS or SCA being a step in the build. It, after you have the artifact, before you push it to the cloud container data center for usage. So what did you mean about it being part of other people's tools? Because you were saying it's probably in some of the things you use. When we were talking before, you were like, you've probably run across it, it's just think, part of something. I think she's oh. referencing like the, the, ref, the, yeah. the security vendors on the malware component. Okay. Yeah. No, well, I think what you're talking about, um, so Reversing Labs, the company's DNA is around the reputational database. 
It came into existence in 2009, and I'll give you the, the kind of history of the company. And it was founded by Thomas Parison and Mario Buxton. They just created a reputational database on malware and kept building. We're adding about 12 million records a day to this of goodware and badware, just to basically reference against uh, the known and the unknown of, of bad malware. And that's all the company was. And then we gave the SOC analyst a UI on top of that reputational database so they could proactively research, detonate um, malware in their own environment. But we were the ones that actually figured out SolarWinds. And we did it with our product, with our capabilities in a reputational database. We released a blog uh, explaining what happened based on reverse engineering the SolarWinds package that was of uh, question. And SolarWinds came to us, other investors said, we want to take this to every man. So that's what we do now. Is we have, still have the reputational database that Microsoft and CrowdStrike and Sentinel One and you name it subscribe to a certain level of feed. But we use that ourselves to help organizations fit that reverse binary analysis into their CI orchestration layer. And I mean, you can be as simplistic as just throwing a file at it too. Because I mean, if you're thinking about that FedEx shipping, shipping out example, you're, you don't have access to FedEx's CI orchestration layer, you just have you know, version 1.7 to 1.8, but we can break apart anything. And then there's a whole different story that wasn't part of this, that if you're interested, so we, we're very big in the malware analysis and threat hunting space for the SOC analyst to basically use that reputational database for the SOC analyst to do their research uh, in an ongoing way. Does that make sense? Yep, no, that's, that's the answer. So thinking about this hourglass analogy, we got- I can bring it back. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so you have all your tools on the left side, right? You've got your IDE, CI, CD, mm -hmm. repositories, right? By inserting your product in the middle, you're theoretically catching anything malicious that was injected on the left side, right? Mm -hmm. um, but do you ever work with um, your clients to, to look at off-the-shelf software like a a seam or like an EDR or something that they're using that's like intimately integrated with the application kind of after deployment? Like Yeah, we, I mean, we can look at any type of file. This is, okay. this use case example is for the, there's two lenses, software creator or consumer. This is the creator story. So if I'm right. writing applications or software for sale or for the internal use of my organizations, this is integrating it into that DevOps program at this point to rip that DLL apart. But there are other feeds of data or even, you know, if you're talking about the whole package from the, the, the SIM environment, or you're talking right. about the data within there. Like, should we scan the new version of the Splunk forwarder that we would stuff? Mm -hmm. We do, we do that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. we do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies use us. That's the third party risk management mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. And, and I mean, like you and, said, and, you just fill out a questionnaire. It's like, yeah. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, let's date. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So when you're looking at like novel malware, right? Are you actually executing the file and then looking for indicators? On the math there? side, yes. On the SSCS side, we're doing that through the kind of the tampering lens, which is the differential analysis. What's in this? What's in this? What files were added, changed, deleted, updated? If all of a sudden there's like five files that shouldn't have been changed in this release, you can set five policy to say, hey, and it may be a false alarm, but it's basically saying like this release wasn't supposed to touch these files and there's changes in them. Or there's a new file that has a slightly different name, typo squatting type attack, that has been inserted. It's like, you know, my app with two P's or one P or three P's, just insert that in there. So it's that differential analysis, it's the behaviors. Again, the, exact, the stupid, very simple example I gave before is, do you know we're communicating over port 80 all of a sudden? I mean, these are the behaviors and they can change and see what behaviors uh, potentially the application is doing programmatically by breaking it apart. The secrets, you know, are we seeing secrets that are um, changed or new or different? And then we basically prioritize them in a way that's like, hey, these are the secrets that are actually doing something. These are dummy secrets. These aren't ac accessing anything like that. And that's where the DNA thing comes in because it's not like new bad malware dot DLL is now my thing. Okay, let's just grab for new bad malware. It's not that easy. But you see those breadcrumb trail, that investigation of like, hey, these files were changed, all of a sudden we're seeing additional behaviors in an application, that provides you with the process, and you say, let's look at the previous version, okay, what's changed? 
So then you can basically hone in and say, okay, let's look at the build server. I mean, SolarWinds is going above and beyond. They actually have a concept of reproducible builds right now, where they're, they're so paranoid, where you have your build pipeline, they created the exact copy of their build pipeline, and then compare the results of each build pipeline to say that, hey, if one pipeline has been compromised, it's highly likely because there's different keys, different logins, different credentials, it's in a lockdown space. If something has changed, we just look at the, the product of the build itself. So it's not only the known malware, it's the DNA or the fingerprints of potential new and different malware. So how would that catch the one where it was the signing software? It was the DLL was actually compromised. They saw a difference when okay. you broke it back apart. Yep. The DLL okay. that was in the signing process was slightly different in terms of its capability. So like if you Using the example of like this blunt forwarder that you should analyze before you update. Um, <clears throat> so do you guys then, do you have a copy of the official Splunk forwarder that you would compare? Like if we it would just be the version itself. So it's like, would you compare it against a known good version? And then you I mean, yeah, exactly. So you can basically say, here's the version I'm currently on. Let's call it version 1.0. You run reverse engineer it, find out all the information on it. And by itself, it's kind of nebulous. It's like, okay, interesting. Right. Yeah. Then they're like, hey, you gotta update the 1.1, great new features, there's a new color on the dashboard, it's really, really cool. But then you have 1.0 and 1.1, you can say, what's different? And using your own uh, um, kind of policies and saying, okay, I'm seeing 10 files changing in this or something. It's just a way to say, call BS on it, because yeah. solar ones people just update it. So do you guys maintain that history of an application's profile, or is that like you have, as an organization, you have to start and then like maintain that yourself? You'd have to maintain it yourself. Okay. I mean, we have like enrich it with data that we've done analysis on malware and things like that, but we're not going to do every version of every software product in the world because yeah. it may not be interesting to somebody, but you can do that on your own products or products you've consumed or products you may want to consume. Um, but that's the biggest thing is people... People aren't going to tell you their stuff sucks. Yeah. And I don't know, everybody I talk to is like, oh, we're, we're so terrible at that. We need to do better. We need more people. Yeah. Our budgets are small. <clears throat> it's, it's a perfect storm for opportunity for the hackers to compromise the, the building of software. So, any other questions? There's probably more pizza. And uh, I'll be around. And thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thank you.